We're submissive, submissive to technology. <laughs> Yes. All right, good to see people here. Um, yes, we decided to have a, a meeting uh, a bit different than what we've been doing. We'll see where it goes. I've been praying about it, and the Lord's been speaking to me, so that means something. Let's we'll see what it exactly means. Let's pray. Yeah, Father, thank you that we are we're under the umbrella of heaven. We're in a safe place because we have one who's seated at your right hand interceding for us. And there's no authority, there's no limit to the authority of Jesus' prayers. So we pray in the name of Jesus that you would protect us from every misleading thought, attitude, memory, or expectation. And we be clearly led by your Spirit to understand the deep things of God for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. As a young Christian, I was uh, unforgettably, actually, moved by two teachings by a South Australian uh, teacher, Jeff Bingham. One was the plan of God in Ephesians 1. The other was a booklet, Is Prophecy for Today? The latter argued that prophetic ministry was always indispensable to the health of the church because prophets declare the saving plan of God. This provided me with an understanding of prophecy which was vastly different from what I'd received from the Pentecostals, who I was with for quite a, year, a number of years. This framework has progressively shaped my life, I need to say that, across the decades. Prophets, and all Christians are called to prophesy, prophets are people with a sense of the true dimensions of the life of Christ. Now, if we had more time, I could say it's especially about his humanity. And the life vision of those who are, are, are sensing the Spirit of God in the prophetic is to see the Lord Jesus, to quote from Philippians, magnified whether by life or death. The prophetic awareness imparts an invaluable sense to the church that what we are seeing and hearing from the Lord is infinitely, and I must use that word, infinitely greater than ourselves. Prophets, or anyone who's heard the testimony of Jesus, cannot tolerate miniaturised views of Jesus because they have an expansive vision of the church in relation to the true magnitude of her Lord. Every church problem, without exception, can be traced back to a diminishing of Jesus. For example, I love these examples. I was, <laughs> I was in a meeting with a couple of the clergy and one of them started speaking about something happening in a very large church in the city which has in intentionally shifted from what we call historical Christianity to progressive Christianity, abandoning things like what they call the penal substitutionary atonement. That is, that Jesus died on the cross, taking the wrath of God in our place. Now, people like this are gripped by a vision of numerical expansion instead of growing upwards into Jesus the head, and to quote Paul from Ephesians 4, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, to the full stature of Christ. Now, this is a tragic mistake. But in our day, the more successful these people are, the more they'll be copied. Which is why this church in general is so mature. God's people need to learn to trust in a different forming of, a form of knowing the kingdom of God than that which operates at the ordinary human level. Every born-again believer has a prophetic dimension to their life. Because all of us, at times, have this sense that God is speaking to us. And we know that God is speaking to us. And we might even realise that Jesus is praying for us. Hopefully we do. The realm of prophecy involves deep spiritual mysteries. But they're not mysterious. Because they always have to do with Christ. Paul, for example, in 1 Corinthians, talks about interpreting spiritual truths... To those who are spiritual, which is all believers, because we all have the Holy Spirit. Prophetic awareness 
is all about entering more deeply into union with the life of God, Father, Son and Spirit. So that means at the heart, at the heart of prophecy uh, is an intense relationship with Jesus. It has nothing in common with uh, accurate weather forecasting or clairvoyance. <laughs> right? It's all about Jesus. Right. Now, um, I have to say, uh, it's a good sign actually, the Lord has been embarrassing me a lot lately and he did it again a few days ago. Um, when I was lecturing at Tabor College, and I can see at least one of my ex-students is here, <laughs> I, I was intrigued by a prophecy uh, from the Pentecostal uh, pioneer Smith Wigglesworth. This is what he said, in part. When the Word and the Spirit come together, there will be the biggest movement of the Holy Spirit that the world has ever seen. So I constructed a whole theological unit on the relationship between the Spirit and the Word. And as I was out praying this week, I sensed the Lord saying, oh, well of course that course came to nothing, because even though the Word is the Word of life, and the Spirit is the Spirit of life, you never treated it, that course as though your whole life depended on what it was teaching. The relationship between the Spirit of God and the Word of God, which is eternal and in which we will live forever, isn't something you can just study. Now this relationship between the Spirit and the Word cannot be ignored because there's grief in the heart of God over a polarisation between word-aligned churches, more like conservative evangelical churches, and spirit-aligned churches like our charismatic Pentecostal friends. As if there could be such a split in the innermost being of God. Well, how could such a division ever have happened in the Church of the Lord? I think because there's an idolatry of the Bible, on the one hand, and an idolatry about powerful spiritual encounters, on the other hand. Both attempts in the end, are about mastering the ways of the Lord. Well, let me speak in some depth about the relationship between the Spirit and the Word, the Holy Spirit and Jesus. The unique Christian testimony, which is in 1 John chapter 4, God is love, means actually in context, the Father is loved, is love. The only means of knowing that God is love, and I mean the only means of knowing that God is love, is to share in the communion that Jesus shared with the Holy Spirit to the glory of the Father. You, see, you always have to go through the humanity of the Son of God, Jesus. The love of God is mediated to us through his plan laid out in the words of Scripture which always point to Jesus and are revealed to us by the Spirit. That is why the testimony of Jesus and the witness of his Spirit in our innermost being is the heart of prophecy. Now, when the Word inside of you and the Spirit inside of you are saying the same thing to you, that's the heart of prophecy. In prayer, sharing the communion with the Word and the Spirit, prophets know themselves to be a vital plan, a part, a vital part of God's plan by unfolding this plan to the people of God. In union with Christ, they know they are share, sharing in the Spirit's witness as they call God's people into an ever deeper immersion in his life. And you can't stop doing that. I have a folder, I brought it tonight, this folder. It's a real folder. Uh, but it, things inside of it are what I want to talk about. Uh, of, of various prophetic messages given to me and Donna from across the years. It's a tragedy that none of them 
accurate as some of them are, and quite accurate, none of them speak deeply of the fatherhood of God. Not one. Something really wrong there. Mature prophecy functions as a mouthpiece of God, which is 1 Peter 4.10, so people hear the Father. And that has to be at the heart of the prophetic ministry. As the Spirit knew he was sent by the Father, and as Christ testified that the Father sent him, which is many places in John's Gospel, so a mature prophetic voice is utterly, inwardly persuaded that they, what they have to say must come from the innermost being of God. That's where the, the constraint comes from. You know it's coming from the innermost being of God, the heart of God. Today, however, and I actually was thinking about this just a little while ago, I mean this afternoon, because I think this is the problem with the teachers. I'm not going to blame the prophets. I'm going to say we've got a problem with the teachers in the church, which leads to confusion amongst the prophets. Today, we live in times when powerful prophetic gifts exist alongside deep relational immaturity. We all know sto stories of, of men and women who've had powerful prophetic vo voices and then they fall away for the usual reasons. I have observed, for example, when prophets try to pass the churches, the church is degraded because people don't get cared for properly. Then there are prophets who only encourage and never correct, or prophets, once a big sin of mine, <laughs> who correct in anger. Uh, I've got over that, I hope. <laughs> we desperately need a reformation of the prophetic gift, and every other one too. All the people of God, right, all the people of God are called to share in a prophetic mode of life, filled with the Spirit, and to live in such a way that others can see that Jesus is the centre of all things. Not some things, not church things, all things. Now, someone sent me... Um, a couple of things to look at during the week and um, about the relationship between psychology and theology and family and, and basically I said these two documents um, the, the problem is they actually have Jesus at the centre so they actually cannot bring the sort of integration of life that Christ himself alone can bring I think functioning prophetic congregations are very rare in our day because, see if you can guess what I'm going to say next, we have had very few prophets of the what? <coughs> very few prophets of the cross. The cross. You know, the death of Jesus, heard about it? <laughs> the cross. The cross is the place where Christ's own prophetic ministry and there's an Old Testament background to that, where his own life and so ministry is perfected. We see hints of this in Hebrews, in the account of the agonies of Gethsemane, and to quote from chapter 5 of Hebrews, in the days of his flesh, and the work, word there is a weak humanity, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears, well, if you're going to pray like Jesus, it'll involve loud, sometimes, loud cries and tears. Some of you already know this. Some of you do not. Loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obeyed him. Now, what's prayer a sign of? Prayer is a sign of the needs of humanity to live, and Jesus quoted this, remember? To live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The earnestness of Christ's blood, sweat and tears in prayer in Gethsemane are a sign he was radically, that is truly conscious, of totally depending on the Father as a frail, mortal human being. 
This consciousness of God dependence for every word of life reaches its climax on the cross. I'm going to talk very briefly about the cry of dereliction. What is the cry of dereliction? It's almost here. Yes, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now this shows us that a split, a very painful split, has opened up in Jesus' self-awareness or Jesus' self-consciousness or Jesus' understanding of himself as God and a human being. Earlier, he could say, with complete boldness, truly, truly, to his opponents, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, he is shaken, bearing our sins on the cross, he is shaken to the very core of his being through a lack of his intimacy with God as his everlasting Father. Now, we cannot really imagine this. He seems to be, at least in his own experience, God without God. Well, if we actually understand the Trinity, we know what that means, but we don't. Here, Jesus accepts what everyone who has lost the glory of God, which is what sin does to you, he accepts what everyone who has lost the glory has refused to accept. No one has anything to say of weight or authority apart from fellowship with the glorious Father in the power of the Spirit. Nothing of weight or authority. Weight is just another word for glory in the Old Testament. Nothing. You cannot say anything of weight or authority, and most particularly of eternal weight or authority. No matter what the politicians try and do apart from fellowship with Christ in the Spirit to the glory of the Father. Jesus knows that only this communion makes him to be what he is, the God-man, the Word of God. And lacking this communion on the cross, he is totally desperate for spiritual renewal. This utterly painful awareness that shatters the communion of the Son of God with the Spirit and the Father is for our <coughs> sanctification, our growth in holiness. It qualifies Jesus, this suffering on the cross, qualifies Jesus to communicate to us that total dependency upon God for his words is the key to eternal life. In union, with, in union with Christ, who in the Bible is the prophet, Christ the prophet, <coughs> prophets know that the Spirit and the Word, the Spirit and the Word are more than life itself, and that seeing and hearing from the Lord is life's highest priority. Your highest priority it's not your father or your mother, not your brother or your sister, not your husband or your wife, not your children or your grandchildren or your boss or your bank account. Your highest priority in this life and forever is to hear the Word of God in the power of the Spirit of God to the glory of God the Father. I have a little prayer, more or less, that I seek to live by. I say to the Lord, what is important to you in this situation? Not what's important to the person on the other side of the table in the coffee shop, or what's important to the people here tonight, but what is important to God? There's nothing worthwhile that is eternal outside of the communion with the Word and the Spirit to the glory of the Father. To suggest otherwise, as was suggested to Eve and Adam and Eden, is the very essence of evil. Now, I need to go a bit deeper here. <laughs> but I need to go a little bit deeper in a very specific way. 
And this is um, the passage we looked at from Revelation. Now I think Revelation 19.10 where the angel tells John, stop worshipping me, worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. I think that is the highest scripture in the whole Bible about what prophecy is. Because what is going on, we have John the Apostle who in his right mind would never think of worshipping an angel. What has happened to him? He knows that to worship anything other than God is an act of idolatry. What has happened to him? He is so overcome by the magnificence of the scene set before him that the glory in the angel's witness to the Lord overpowers him. The startling truth that is at the heart of the prophetic witness is that the Lamb, to quote earlier passages in Revelation, standing as slain from the foundation of the world, that the Lamb is a husband. How remarkable. A husband without beginning or end, with a wife as ordinary as the seven churches of whom the Spirit has spoken so clearly in the early chapters of Revelation. A weak, sinful and incomplete wife. Like us. Yes, you and me. Weak, sinful, incomplete. But loved by Jesus. Mature prophets. See the beauty of the Lord in his bride. Isn't this remarkable? And have a vision of her future, unlimited, all-glorious self. Can you believe it? I'm not sure if you do or not. Maybe God will help us. Because Jesus is always seeing this. Jesus is always speaking about this. Jesus is always calling the church to her destiny. What the prophets share with Jesus, with the Spirit and with the angels, because they appear in this story, is that each of these beings bears witness to someone whom they love more than themselves. This love is seen in bringing glory to the one they love, whatever the cost. Now we know this. We know it's about Jesus. The sacrificial love of the Lamb of God for the church shows that Christ has loved us more than he loved himself. The real question is, do we love Jesus? This is very much in the Gospels. Do we love Jesus more than we love ourselves? The potency, you know, the strength, the potency of the prophetic witness to Jesus as the spirit of prophecy is that prophets, or those who speak from the Lord, which can be all of us, keep reorienting the church to her marital bonds, you know, not being married, of exclusive devotion to Christ. Jesus must be first, Jesus must be last, Jesus must be everything in between. Well, and they keep that reorienting going, whatever the cost to themselves. You know throughout scripture the prophets suffer. Mostly, who causes the suffering of the prophets? The unfaithful people of God. So the prophets are the archetypal, or the, or the, you know, the best example of, of the witnesses who conquer the devil by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. You know, let me tell you something. It's one of those secrets. Suffering for Jesus is wonderful. When you suffer for Jesus, you see things in the Spirit. You see something of the glory which is coming and which will last forever. 
You know, I get on these Zoom meetings with all these brothers and sisters from across Asia and that, and they tell us about all these terrible things, you know, in some of these countries and different places. And uh, You're a Christian, we're not going to give you medical treatment for this virus. Your mission societies or your NGOs can take care of you. Happens all the time. And what's happening to those churches? They're getting stronger and stronger and stronger. We don't seem to understand this. Few of us might. Well, I'm moving towards the conclusion. A church without functioning prophets. Now, you must understand, I'm trying to restructure your thinking about what prophecy is from the Bible. A church without functioning prophets will always fail to understand that God's plan from the beginning has been to have a company of saints, holy men and women, perfect in holiness, fit to enjoy his presence forever in marriage to his son. The prophetic life not just the prophetic voice. The prophetic life is a sharing in the intimacy of the Lamb and the Spirit for the sake of the wedding ordained by the Father. Such things are too great for words, aren't they? As such, the prophetic life brings with it an intimacy that involves joy, love, anticipation, longing, and much heartbreak. The prophetic life is a life forged through the depths of shared Christ-like sufferings but lived in resurrection power. I was thinking somehow today of uh, some years ago I was at a particular congregation and I said to one of the pastors there, I said, Dave, if it doesn't work out here, I think it's all over for me. And guess what happened? There was a plot against me. And I had to go. But here I am still. <laughs> because somehow the Lord revived me, somehow. After many <laughs> rejections. This uh, utterly painful awareness. Oh, sorry, wrong page. <laughs> <laughs> All, all, all who live like what I've been talking about can resonate with and repeat from their hearts, not just quote it, repeat from their hearts the very last plea of the Bible. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come! Come quickly, Lord Jesus! Now, I'm not sure I've ever been with a group of people that really want that. Really want it. You know, like a congregation or a church that wants it. Anyway. But you can be like that. Whatever other people might be like, you can be one of those people who can say, yeah, come, 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 I want you to come. Clean up this mess, but more than clean up this mess, reveal your glory. That's the main thing. Right, I am at the conclusion. <clears throat> this is the application part. The rest of well, it might have been entertainment, might it? <laughs> Think of entertainment? Anyway, <laughs> I shouldn't give those sort of jokes because um, <laughs> they're never funny, <laughs> but they always have a point. <laughs> uh, let's get to the end. No one. That's no one, you know. No one who desires to bear witness to Jesus can say about the prophetic life, that's not me. No one who has been saved by Christ's blood should refuse to be a prophet of the cross. Every single one of you is called to be a prophet of the cross. What does that mean? Speaking of the glorious death of our Lord Jesus Christ, in the power of the Spirit, to the glory of God the Father, which is the, the framework of the whole creation, actually. Prophets of the cross. 
Now, I think these are properties of the normal Christian life. I didn't say the average Christian life. The reason why we hesitate about such things, such testimonies to Jesus, is that our vision of Christ is too what? Too small. We are hemming in Jesus. But thankfully, Jesus has a way out. And his way out is to immerse us more deeply in the shape of the gospel. Now what I mean by the shape of the gospel, you might have to think about this, but I really believe it's biblical. As the Spirit was the powerful presence by which Jesus made himself nothing in incarnation and crucifixion, and the energy by which his humanity was limitlessly expanded in resurrection and glorification. So the power of the Spirit is the way forward for the church today. There isn't any other way forward. That was Jesus' only way forward. And if the Spirit never failed Jesus, because the Spirit was sent by the Father, will the Spirit in his being sent today fail the purposes of God? Impossible. I do believe the Lord is talking about a spirit-generated expansion of the Word of God. That is, an intensification of the presence of the life of Christ in his church. So that the church grows inwardly into growing riches of fellowship in Christ and grows outwardly by mission to the world. Such growth of the Word in the Spirit to the glory of the Father Amen. must be the subject of our earnest prayers. Yes. Now when I was praying during the week when I was thinking about how do we respond to this I thought well there will be some people they will want prayer because they felt the Lord speaking to them tonight. And there'll be other people who can pray for them. Okay? 